That's the like Cuban Linux penguin. <laughs> In orbit. Is that real? Pretty good, yeah, it is. That's a real Linux That's penguin in cool. orbit. <laughs> that photo was that photo was taken in altitude of about 32 kilometers in January, I think it was, just over Adelaide. Okay. So there have been some amazing talks today. That last session was really cool. And um, it was interesting to see that it was so hands-on in a subject that most of the time we really can't get our hands on to it. You know, most people don't hack around with um, genetically engineered machines in their spare time. And that was a demonstration of the fact that a lot of the things that you think may be beyond your ability, you actually can do now, things that you couldn't do a couple of years ago. And what I'm going to do is, um, is look at some technology that would be considered high tech by the typical person in the street. So we're coming back from talk of the singularity and looking way out into the future and looking at stuff that we can do right now. In fact, we're going to go a little bit further back again and look at how manufacturing and the ability to influence our environment has changed over the last couple of hundred years. So starting with cottage industries, a couple of hundred years ago, if you wanted some artifact, something manufactured in the most basic sense, you would go to an artisan, um, there would be a local skilled person who would service a particular niche which was limited by geography. Distribution networks weren't really available other than for very high value items. So everybody would deal with their local cottage industries for supply of things that they couldn't make themselves. And of course that changed um, through the Industrial Revolution with mass manufacturing and distribution. And um, but, so what we have now is economics of supply and demand that are based on mass production. It's very centralised and it's reliant on a distribution mechanism. So what we have are a lot of products that are very homogenous. You have a manufacturer who will create something in very large numbers and through economies of scale they will be able to do it cheaper than anybody who could do it locally and then distribute it either regionally, nationally or globally. And so we end up with products that are very similar around the world. And you also end up with situations where lots and lots of people buy the same thing. Things are manufactured generally to the lowest common denominator. And you end up with situations like this. This is the queue to buy an iPhone at the Regent Street store <laughs> in London. Everybody wants whatever the latest hot item is. So it's just for a second, we'll look at some of the economics of mass manufacturing. And this will come back in a moment. We'll talk about how this has changed. And we're looking at some parts here on a printed circuit board. And one of the design decisions that is made is balancing up what's called non-recurring engineering costs, or NRE, versus recurring costs. When you manufacture something, you have materials costs, and you have the input, which is the design and various other things, that you need to amortise across the number of items that you manufacture. Now, the particular example here is we have a couple of parts on a circuit board. Now, for scale, that part on the bottom right, which is, happens to be a resistor, is um, in a package called 0603, which is 0.8 of a millimetre vertically by 1.6 millimetres this way. So they're quite small parts, and um, in fact I have some here I can show people with a microscope so you can look at them later if you want to. And it might cost, say, half a cent for one of those parts. When you are setting up to manufacture a circuit board and um, going to a production company that puts all of the pieces on the board for you using robotic pick and place machines, there are a couple, of a couple of costs you have to take into consideration. One is the cost of the part itself. So in this case, a resistor, say half a cent. The, there is also a part placement cost. When they're doing the setup, they will say, you have 237 parts on this board. We will charge you half a cent per part that we place. So you have an additional half cent. So you have a total cost of getting that part on the board of one cent. The part up here is called a resistor network. It's four resistors in one little package and it might cost, say, two cents. So it's the same part cost as if you bought four individual resistors. However, you're only placing one part. So you have a total part cost here of 2.5 cents versus placing four individual resistors of four cents. 1.5 cents per board. Yay. And this is the sort of stuff that mass manufacturers really care about. Because if you have an engineer, say you have engineers on a salary of, say, $100,000 a year, very rough terms, it works out to be about 60 bucks an hour. 
So if you are manufacturing, if it, it takes, say, an extra half an hour to place this part and then route all the tracks on the board, um, and you're producing any more than 1,200 units, you've just made your money back on the engineer's time to do that one and a half cent saving. So everything about mass manufacturing is engineered around trimming little bits of cost off and dealing with very large numbers of products. And so most of my talk now is going to be about how that is being turned around. So what is happening now is that we are, in a sense, returning to cottage industries. We are seeing much more specialised manufacturers operating at a smaller level um, and at a niche level. But instead of being restricted by geographic area, they're now restricted by vertical niche. Because we now have all of the distribution mechanisms in place, we have FedEx and that sort of thing, you can be a small manufacturer in a, in a little town supplying the world within a specific vertical niche. So you can now have, uh, you could be producing something that only a few people will want. They might be distributed all around the world, but that is now economically practical. And there are a whole lot of reasons that this is coming about. So the next part of the talk is really going to be a little bit of a ramble over some of the influences that are happening. Um, one of these is the rise of hackerspaces um, and the influence of the open source movement into hardware as well. So you've all now seen open um, genetic engineering. You're probably all familiar with open source software. Open hardware is now on the rise. And that is often taking place in self-organised groups called hackerspaces. So this is a photo taken at um, the Melbourne Hackerspace, which is at hackmelbourne.org. And um, you can see in there Andy Jelmy, who's going to be doing a talk in a little while about the Internet of Things. This is a place that people can come together and cooperate on designs. They can brainstorm things that will suit their particular requirements, not some mass manufactured product, but a case of, I have this idea for something, but I don't necessarily have all the skills and people can pull together to work on something that can then become a fully manufactured professional quality item. Another influence is that a lot of the professional equipment now is finding its way onto eBay. So this is a photo, it's, um, it's actually an ultrasound machine. Um, this is a photo taken in my friend's garage. Um, he decided he wanted an ultrasound machine, so he found one on eBay, bought it for $400. Um, you can buy pick and place machines, you can buy um, tunneling electron microscopes, you can buy all sorts of things that in their quest for increased efficiency, um, the major manufacturers and, um, and big companies will sell off because they upgrade them, they want to save one and a half cents per board, so they need better equipment. So you can buy a lot of this stuff now um, through places like eBay. Um, actually, one of the things is that once we set up that um, that scanner in his garage, we just obviously sit around and, um, and look at things on the ultrasound machine, because <laughs> you can. And uh, this is just, this is actually a scan of my arm. And um, you can see a couple of markers up there. So this is the skin up here, um, bone down here somewhere. And what you see there, that's actually a little capsule. That's an RFID chip, which is just under the skin of my arm. So um, I wanted to see how that, yeah, we want to see how that looks. So that's what's under my arm. And this comes down to one of the points as well, which is repurposing commercial technology or taking technology that has been developed for one thing and using it for something else. In this case, implantable RFID has been developed for pet tagging. Um, I thought, hey, that would be cool. I'm going to try it on myself. So I implanted one under my arm using, um, using one of these tools. So I can now be scanned using, you know, by a vet and they can get my ID. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, and I also modified a computer keyboard with a homemade RFID reader so I can unlock the keyboard just by, uh, unlock the computer just by putting my arm over it. And um, I can unlock the front door of my house as well, various other things. Um, I also put a scanner in the, um, the back right window of my car so I can walk up to my car, put my arm near it, and the car unlocks and the engine starts. Um, so this is an example of taking something designed for one thing and using it for something else. And a lot of these little building blocks can then be used to build up something that will suit your particular requirements, not what the manufacturer intended. A great example of that is this little device here. You probably, anyone who's got a TV would have seen ads for the Kinect. Uh, this is a device that came out from Microsoft quite recently as a peripheral for the Xbox video game system. And it's, um, it's actually technology that's been around for a few years, but in a very expensive form. And what they did was 
um, and, and uses a technology called LiDAR, which is like radar in that it sends something out and then measures a reflection in order to, um, to get a sense of what's out there. Except that it uses light, which is why it's L instead of R instead of radio waves. And um, it uses a system called structured light, where it projects a series of dots out onto its environment. And the dots are diverging from the point of origin, and there is a camera in it which reads back in, in infrared the position of all of those dots. And if you're, you could imagine, for example, the dots are um, diverging. If you read it back in and you discover the dots are close together, then there must be something close in front of you. The further apart they are, then the further away it is. So this becomes a three-dimensional depth scanner. Now, this technology has been around in robotics and various other things for a number of years, but at a really high price point. And what Microsoft did was manufacture these at such massive quantities that they managed to pull the price down to the point where you can go and buy one of these for, um, when they launched it was $199, I think it was, for something that a couple of months before you would have spent $5,000 to acquire. And it's got lots of really interesting things in it, but this is, um, the story behind gaining access to this is quite interesting. It can do some really cool things. Oh, and this will give you a better idea of, of what it can do. Um, it's got both an RGB camera in it and a depth camera. So this is um, obviously me holding my hand up. And you can see in the RGB camera, uh, the, all of the tones and things like that are reproduced. The depth camera is showing position. Now, what, the critical thing about this is that it allows you to take previous, uh, previously well-known techniques like edge detection and um, you know, image processing algorithms, apply them to the depth data instead of the image data and get dramatically better results. Now you can imagine, for example, if you were doing gesture detection using a standard camera, you're trying, you need to find the edges of objects within it. Now if the back wall here, the colour is quite similar to my hand colour, edge detection around there would be very buggy. You apply that exact same algorithm here and it's obvious, you can see exactly where the edges of the objects are. And so when this came out, a lot of people thought, this is fantastic, we could use this for DIY robotics projects and things, but there was a bit of a problem. Um, so what happened was that the Connect was launched on November 4th last year and um, an open source hardware hacky hacker named um, Lamore Free uh, bought one on the day it was launched and put a USB sniffer on the connection to the Xbox so that she could see what data it was sending back because of course this is totally undocumented. And she thought this would be really cool but I need to be able to interpret this data and not just plug it into my Xbox. So she published the packet dumps of the data that the, that the Connect was sending and said, I'll give $1,000 to anyone who releases an, op an open source driver to talk to this thing. And um, CNET immediately got on the phone to Microsoft and said, would you care to make a comment? And they basically said, does not condone the modification of its products, yada, 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 um, working with law enforcement, et cetera, et cetera. So they obviously weren't very friendly to the idea of people using this, uh, this product for something that they hadn't condoned or they hadn't thought of. Um, so uh, an hour later, the more increased the bounty <laughs> because she saw this as an issue of interoperability. She wanted to be able to take something and use it for her own purposes, whatever those purposes were. Um, and then the next day, nothing much happened, so she increased the bounty again. She, was, she thought this would be a, an interesting case study. And then nothing much happened. A number of people within the US um, did some work reverse engineering the communications protocol. Nobody published anything. Um, and about a week later, the Connect was launched in Europe. This was the, um, the US launch. And um, this gentle looking guy um, walked into a, um, a store. His name's Hector. And um, you wouldn't think that um, you know, he's a bit of an, he's an intimidating character, but he was, um, he was one of the guys who cracked uh, the Apple security, I think it was, on, um, on the iPhone. And um, so at nine o'clock in the morning, he walked into a store and bought one of these things. Didn't have an Xbox to plug it into, just the device itself. Three hours later, he published video <laughs> proof <laughs> and the source code of a working driver. So later that day, Lamore said, okay, here's the winner. And because we need to protect our rights to uh, modify devices and use them for our own purposes, no matter what the manufacturer says, she also donated $2,000 to the Electronic Frontiers Foundation, um, who would be the people who would probably step in and defend Hector if anything actually came of this. And a little while later, 
Microsoft announced that they were inspired to see that this had happened, and that it was a bit left open by design. Um, okay, interesting. But the, the point is that taking these sorts of things and modifying them to our own purposes allows us to do things that the original manufacturer probably never intended. Um, in this particular case, it's not even modifying the device. All it is is reading data from it. And you can do a whole lot more once you start modifying things. So to give you some ideas of um, the kind of things that can be done with it, this was a little demo that Andy Jolmy and I set up um, in January. Uh, what I did was use um, OpenCV, the OpenCV library, to do um, hand gesture detection and, um, gest and you know, hand position detection, and the Open and Eye library as well. And then we translated those to controls going to a quadcopter. And the objective here is to essentially become a Jedi. <laughs> so imagine you have the force and you can levitate things and push them pretty well. Yeah. So that quadcopter is flying semi-autonomously. It's maintaining its own altitude control and um, attitude control and was receiving high-level signals telling it to move this direction or move that direction based on the gestures that I was um, sending to it. Now in doing that, that was a little bit tricky. <laughs> I actually sat down and um, sketched up on a piece of paper the coordinates, X, Y, Z, and I was figuring out hot zones in space, so if I moved my hand here, then it would apply a push gesture, so use the force and push it. <laughs> um, but that sort of thing is really messy and, um, and hard to work with. And um, I got, also, there's no visual feedback. So I got to thinking, in a game context, what you typically do is, um, is you get feedback that you don't get in real life. So in this case, I selected a door to uh, open it using the force in the game. And um, it, became, it was highlighted in blue. So within the context of games and, um, and within the context of the computer, we have become accustomed to feedback, or um, what's called in user interface term affordances, that you don't get in the real world. And so the problem with interfacing uh, something like the connect and gesture recognition in the real world is that you don't necessarily know if you have selected the right thing. So you want to apply a gesture to one thing and something else is affected. Um, we really just don't have this, uh, this sort of level of response. So to get around that problem, in this particular case I have, it, I have gesture control of curtain controllers. And I set it up so that when the curtains were selected they would uh, glow blue. And that way I'd know that I'd selected that object and then any gestures that I applied to it would then alter that. So this is all part of the quest of becoming a Jedi through misuse of technology. No midichlorians involved. Um, now in this particular case, what I was doing was really just plugging together a bunch of building blocks. The building blocks themselves are not particularly complicated. The, just, the um, connect obviously connected to a Linux box, which was talking via a network to a little Arduino-based device, which was talking to the, uh, the blind controller. Um, so this leads into the next stage, which is not just taking existing devices and using them for your own purposes, but actually developing or modifying your own devices. And the Arduino device I'm talking about here is this one. Um, that's actually two boards. You can see at the bottom there's a PCB, which is the Arduino itself. On top there is an Ethernet adapter that's plugged into it. So you can consider that to be a bit like a, a PC and an expansion card, but on a very small scale. And the design for the Arduino is open. It's been released as a Creative Commons design, so um, the circuit board design, the schematic and all of that sort of stuff, anyone can go and download it. You can manufacture it if you want to. And um, that's what it looks like. Uh, that's a, a slightly older version, but you get the idea. And the entire device, in fact, I, um, I have a few here if anybody wants to look at them afterwards. So that's the size of it. That's what they look like. And um, I was working on a book a little while ago for uh, related to Arduino. And while I was working on this book, I needed to design a whole lot of projects and document them. And the typical project was something like, in this particular case, it's a receiver for data that's transmitted at 433 megahertz. And I was using it to receive data from a rocket telemetry system. So this was a little launch we did just out of Croydon. And um, the rocket was transmitting data from accelerometers, 
uh, back to the Arduino that was plugged into the laptop and logging all the data. Um, I think it was about 10 times a second. And I needed to design these projects, and in the process of doing this, I was going through an awful lot of these little PCBs, which, um, this is the yellow one, but very similar to that, it's the same dimensions, which is a little prototyping board, and I was buying them um, about 10 at a time and from a US supplier. This particular package that you see here, what you get in that bundle, retails for about $16. So every time I bought 10 of those, it was more money going out of my pocket. And um, a friend of mine who is an electronics engineer said, hey, you can get it a lot cheaper than that, and um, I'll show you how. So he sent me over to, uh, and the other thing is you can manufacture PCBs yourself, but um, that's fine if you want to do one or two of them. If you want a lot, they become really tedious, very time consuming. So he um, sent me over to a Chinese PCB supplier where you log in, upload your design files, give them your credit card details or PayPal, and they manufacture it for you. So I did that with the design. And about two weeks later, I had a big bundle of about 100 of these PCBs for what it would have cost me to get 10, um, based on buying from someone else. And I even modified the design so that it would suit my requirements better. And this was the start of the journey of manufacturing to suit my own requirements. So that particular design of that PCB was made exactly the way I wanted to make it, not the way some other supplier had decided I should have it. And so I applied the same approach to a whole lot of other projects in the book. This is a security sensor. Um, on the left you can see the, um, the handmade prototype version. On the right it's a PCB that's been manufactured specifically for that purpose. And um, I had 50 of those PCBs made and it cost I think it was about $120. So we're talking about quite small numbers of, uh, of items that traditionally you would get made in tens or hundreds of thousands of units at a time at a price point that makes it economical to do it. And this is quite a change. You couldn't do this probably three or four or five years ago. Now this is a sort of change that's come about in the electronics industry over the last few years as a lot of these suppliers have opened themselves up to very small scale manufacturing. Um, similar way, this is an RFID lock prototype on the left and the manufactured unit on the right. So making PCBs is one thing, but then dealing with the parts is something else. Uh, as I said, the, uh, well, this particular part is 0.8 millimetres by 1.6 millimetres in size. So assembling this stuff could be quite tricky as well. Now, the interesting thing in this photo for everybody else is probably the part itself. For me, the interesting thing is this scar here, which is where I burnt the end of my finger off when I was about seven. Um, trying to wire up a light to 240 volts and touch the wire. So <laughs> I learned that the hard way. Um, now you can assemble these things yourself. I've become a little bit infamous for using garden tools for soldering surface mount parts. Um, so that is a 0.8 millimeter wide part being held down by uh, gardening tongs. Um, but there are better ways to do it. So I have a, a stereo inspection microscope here that people can have a look at later. And this is literally my kitchen table at home. So this is showing you the genesis of a home-based business on the kitchen table. And uh, so I've got the microscope for doing assembly using um, solder paste that is squeezed out of a, a very small syringe onto the board itself, and then tweezers to place the parts on the, um, into the paste. And that all then goes into that toaster oven on the right-hand side. <laughs> and the toaster oven melts the solder paste and reflows it, you let it cool down and um, you have a fully assembled board with all of these tiny parts over it. So you can actually manufacture um, very small scale parts yourself at home, literally on the kitchen table with a toaster oven. That sort of thing is quite feasible. It drives you insane though if you're doing more than about two of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then the next question is how do you go beyond that? So the next stage is you can have a PCB manufactured by a professional fabrication house. Now I want to get it totally assembled. So the process is that you have a design that you work from. It might be an open hardware design. In this particular case, it's the design for one of these boards. This is the, um, this, what's called the schematic layout. So that's the conceptual design of the circuit. And what it shows you are um, visual representations of the parts and how they connect to each other. Um, so you don't need to understand what they are, but just as an example, up here, this little three pin part is a voltage regulator. So you get a voltage coming in this side on this connection, and you don't know what that voltage is, but then on the outside it's been nicely leveled off at a, well, at a known voltage. 
So you arrange the parts conceptually. Um, and this is very similar to that last exercise um, using iGEM where you have inputs and outputs. You have blocks and you link them all together to achieve the overall end result. Once you have the, the, um, the functional schematic, you then go to a PCB layout where the actual physical representation of the parts needs to be moved into the right place on the board itself. And once you're happy with that, um, basically you press a button, it generates some production files that you can then email off to a manufacturing house in China or there are many of them right here in Victoria. They're all over the world, but um, uh, I tend to use a place in China. And then you sit and wait. And about three weeks goes by and then the UPS dude knocks on the door and you have a big box and you have a whole lot of these devices that have been manufactured professionally in a factory in China using um, the same pick and place machines that build iPhones and all of those sorts of consumer things made to my own design. And that is amazing. The fact that you can do that now at a price point that is very similar to going out and buying something that's been mass produced. Now part of that obviously is there's no middleman. I'm um, having something manufactured and then delivered to my door. So I don't need to pay markups on retailers and things like that. But we are now at a stage where with a little bit of knowledge in a similar way to plugging together parts in um, iGEM, you can now plug together parts and have a device manufactured exactly to suit your specs. So this leads us into the near future and, um, and what is coming now. Uh, this is a MakerBot. Um, in fact, the real one is right here. Hold it up so you can see it. So that is a 3D printer. Uh, I know there's been a bit of talk about these today. Um, some of you may not have actually seen one for real. So that will, um, if anybody wants to look at it later, it'll be up here. The general uh, principle behind 3D printers, or this particular type of 3D printer, is that it uses an extrusion head um, that is a bit like a hot glue gun. You can imagine that with the hot glue gun you squeeze the trigger and glue comes out and then it solidifies as it cools. In this case the feedstock goes down into it, it's melted within the, um, the feed head and is extruded as a very thin uh, ribbon. And by moving the, uh, the base around and moving the head up progressively, you can deposit layers of material and then build 3D objects. So, once again, I've got a whole bunch of examples here that people can have a look at. Now, these are fairly crude examples. I can help you hand these back. These are just some crude examples of stuff that's physically come out of this 3D printer. Now, what's cool about this is that it means that the design, it, the, the last age I was talking about, is um, making use of cheap distribution to, um, to leverage the manufacturing facilities that are already existing for mass manufacturing and using it for our own personal manufacturing. What this is doing is totally bypassing the distribution mechanism. Yeah, they work. <laughs> um, is totally bypassing distribution and getting to the point where we are taking the design for something, shipping it directly to the person who wants it and then physically forming that object on the spot where the person is. And it starts by taking a design in something like SolidWorks or um, Google SketchUp and manipulating it so that it represents physically the object that you want. You can then run it through the printer and the object comes out the other end. So you can go from concept or design that you've downloaded off the internet to a physical artifact. And if you need more of them, you just print more of them. Now, as you can see, the resolution on this particular printer is not very good. And it has a limitation in that the, it has um, a limited uh, a type of feedstock that it can use. But there are many designs for 3D printers that use different feedstock, um, different types of print heads. There is an updated version of this now that has a thing that's a bit like a conveyor belt. So you can print large objects that are physically bigger than um, the device itself. And there are also designs um, for the, uh, there's a design called the RepRap, well, there's a RepRap project which has a number of designs where many of the parts for the printer, in fact some of the parts on this printer, these dolly wheels up the top, these were printed on another one of these. So the printers can be used to print parts to make more of themselves. So the objective with the RepRap project is that it self-replicates. Once you have one, you can print the parts to make another one and then share it around. 
So what this does is totally um, decentralize the, the manufacturing of physical objects. And um, in fact, there was a screenshot in the, um, the previous talk about Thingiverse. This is a place where people share designs. So someone comes up with an idea for something, they design it, and they upload it, and then someone else can download it. So this is like open source of our physical world, of artifacts around us. Now, imagine that this, a couple of years from now, has been commercialized by uh, the big manufacturers. And this was someone's concept of what would happen if Apple took on this idea and made a 3D printer. It'd look a whole lot more polished, but the concept is still the same. Now, other feedstock. This is where things get really interesting. This particular example is printing food. Um, I can't remember what's in this. There are a couple of different pastes. I think it may be um, some kind of shellfish based uh, paste. And um, in this particular case, it's a little space shuttle that's been printed and then cooked. So you can, you can print food and cook it. And we'll come back to that in just a second, because this comes down to that old tea or grey hot situation. Um, other applications. There's been a lot of research done over the last couple of years at the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine in terms of applying this technology to medical uh, requirements. And in this particular example, what they're doing is printing skin. So down on, the, um, on here, they've got a couple of different print heads that are dispensing skin cells, collagen. Um, there's a, another gel that goes over the top of it. And it's combined with a 3D scanner. So the objective here, and you can see in this little example, is that they, um, oh, <laughs> first application of this is military, unfortunately, but at least their, um, uh, at least their objectives are, are good. What they want to do is have a hospital bed, a patient bed, where they can lie someone down who has had um, some kind of injury to their skin, um, like it could be a cut or a burn or something like that. The system scans the body, detects the, uh, the outline of the injury, and then prints new skin directly into the spot where the injury has occurred. And they have got this to the point now where it's working in laboratory trials. And um, for third degree burns, it cuts the recovery time down to I think around 22% of the, of the recovery time if this treatment wasn't applied. So it's making quite a significant difference. One of the other things they're using it for is printing kidneys. So this is a kidney that's been half printed. Uh, so they're moving up from simple physical structures to more complex structures. With, with, in a kidney, for example, it's obviously got very high vascularity. So um, this is still a couple of years away from trials in terms of actual implantation. Um, but they're at the point now where I think it takes between six and eight hours they can print a kidney to suit particular requirements. So a few years from now, there'll be no such thing as waiting for kidney donors. You just go into the operating theater and they'll print a kidney for you on the spot. Um, now, the TL grey hot thing. What we're talking about here, obviously, is printing uh, biological material. So this raises the whole issue. If you had, imagine a couple of years down the track, you have a device that is kind of similar to this, but it looks like a microwave. It could be sitting in your kitchen, and it has multiple feedstocks all going into it. You could dial up the steak, and it prints the plate, and then prints the steak on top of it, and prints the sauce on the steak. So, the technology for doing this is actually being put in place right now, and it's not really that far away. Another issue here is printing of complex objects. We've been talking so far primarily about physical artifacts, um, and also I mentioned the idea of printing parts for one 3D printer using another 3D printer. The stage we're at right now is we can print things like wheels and cogs and bits and pieces, you can even print the physical structure. You can print the plates that are used to, manuf to assemble it. But what about the electronics? There are obviously, um, you know, there's a microcontroller on there and, and various things that need to actually control this. And there are the motors. There are <coughs> complex physical structures. Um, some researchers recently have been working with this same technology. In fact, um, what do you see at the back there is a, um, a 3D printer. It's a bit of a homebrew job. It's made on a piece of wood with some stuff screwed onto it. And they have modified drafting pens to carry um, chemicals. And they are printing transistors onto a film. And these transistors are actually fully functional. So they can print functional electronics straight onto a surface. So imagine combining a number of these technologies. 
the ability to print um, the, mat, the gross physical structure plus the fine electronics onto it, you could in theory be printing integrated circuits not very far from now. Uh, at the other end of the scale, this is a 3D printer being used to extrude concrete. So it was mentioned earlier about, um, I think it was Avatar who mentioned printing houses. Yes. Um, so there is some work being done in the US and the UK. So this is an example in the UK. That's a, a mammoth scale 3D printer. You can't really get a concept of it from there, but this gantry is really, really very big. You could drive a car through there, like through one of these holes. Um, and this was all done on a 3D printer. There is a researcher um, up in Brisbane, I believe, um, who I met at LCA in January, who is, is actually the guy who holds the patent on the machine that makes hay bales. Like he um, is an engineer who designed that, the very first one of those machines, I think it was in the 70s. What he's been working on the last couple of years is printing houses. And um, so he's been making a lot of progress in that. By combining a lot of these technologies, it's not inconceivable that a few years from now you'll be able to wheel a machine onto a construction site, turn it loose, and a little while later you've got a house that's been physically printed in place to your particular designs. So what I've shown you are really a, a whole lot of different things, and it, it might seem a little bit random, but these are all different elements or different um, things that are happening in the world of manufacturing that are all coming together to, um, to take manufacturing or production of consumer devices from something that is done by an elite few designers on a very large scale in a centralised way and turning consumers into producers and designers, giving them the tools that they need to take their ideas and then physically embody them in something that they can use. So, thank you. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. I'll take the mic. What, what topological limitations do you have and what, what's printable? Ah, okay. There is a trade off. The question was um, what are the topological limitations and what's printable? There is a trade off um, between things like print speed and resolution. Now, with the photo I showed a second ago of printing concrete, the resolution on that is obviously rubbish. <laughs> But the print speed is going to be quite good because it's extruding a large amount at a time. If you tried to print a 0.1 millimetre filament of concrete, it would take you forever. Um, so in all of these things, there is a trade-off between um, the material that you're using and the resolution. Now, the particular samples that I've passed back, you can see they're quite grainy. And it is possible to, um, to print at a higher resolution than that, but then it takes a lot longer. So if you make something that's 10 times as accurate, it's going to take more than 10 times as long to actually print. And um, objects this size, like uh, this is bringing us back to reality for a moment, object that size might take a couple of hours to print. So it's not the sort of thing where you press a button and then you, it goes ding and you open the door and go, hmm, chicken. It takes a bit longer than that. But, but just sort of common sense. I mean, imagine you, you have some shape, but something like a hook, something like that. Mm. I mean, are there some particular shapes or topologies where there yes. are holes? Are there some Yep. Some instructions you just can't, just, just okay. the nature of things, you just can't. Overhands are a big problem. Um, with this particular printing technology, because the material comes out in a semi-liquid um, you know, semi form, you can imagine that if you were trying to print a hook that was shaped like that and you're printing it vertically, it's very hard to print an overhang and it will tend to sag and you'll get all sorts of nasty artifacts. Um, there are ways to overcome that. One of the ways that that is done is by using a supporting substrate that does not become part of the end product. Um, and it might sound bizarre, but one of the products that's one of the materials that's used for that is icing, like used on cakes. So what happens is that you can print support structures out of icing, and then print your plastic or whatever it is around it, yeah, so and then you just wash it away. Wash and you're like, what about printing zero gravity? Zero gravity. Printing zero, zero gravity. That would be great. <laughs> um, if I could get funding to experiment with that. that would be <laughs> Um, yeah, print heads that rotate and, very, and things um, are also a factor. Um, I, I was just going to ask, um, considering you know the, the rapid rate of technological progress here, for you, Jonathan, personally, realistically, how long do you see it before it can print itself? Um, one of these? Yeah. Really? Mm. How, how long do you think? In its entirety, including electronics and all of that sort of thing. Yeah. 
on the women. Yeah, um, it's, it's still a fair way off. Um, at the moment, it's fairly crude in terms of the percentage of parts that it prints is fairly low, but it's increasing. With some of these designs, they are now printing almost the entire mechanical structure, um, but at the moment, the electronics is the big hang-up. You just can't do that right now, other than really simple things like those researchers who are printing transistors. But there's a long way to go from printing a transistor to printing an M, uh, like a microcontroller with 10 million transistors on it. How about the nano level? Has anyone tried to do that kind of thing, combine the idea with STMs, scanning, tunneling microscopes? So, 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 so if you do that, you could build brain. Brains. <laughs> <laughs> brain, yes. Brains. What, what about assembly process? Um, assembly are separate parts. The attempting to do that by human hand. At this point, yeah. Um, one of the one of the drivers for this is on the spot manufacturing. So if you have a, a design for something which is multiple parts and needs assembly, normally that would be done on a production line or in a factory or something like that, either by hand or by robots. The thing is that that takes away from the whole economic benefit of delivering it directly to the consumer. So the idea is that you want something, you might want one of them you printed on the spot. You're not making a thousand of them for different people. So yeah, it tends to be much more hand assembly. Uh, this might be a really silly question, but when you talk about uh, printing a kidney, for example, or printing medical parts, um, what's the what's the actual source substance, the feed substance, substance you're using there? Personally, I don't know. <laughs> That's not my field. Um, my understanding is that they... Oh, do you have an answer? Well, there's a couple of ways. You can either print a biomaterial and then just uh, based on the cells, or you can actually print with... Um, yeah, like a mixture of stem cells and biomaterials, and the biomaterials is also in the body when it's transformed. As a, uh, as a great great talk. Yeah, Chad, talk about that, exactly. Where they, um, they, they, they talk the, um, still the biomass for the young, young guy. Uh, the progress has been going on for about eight years now. They took some biomass out of this young man, and they put some kidney. They put it inside. So all, all the material was housed from the past. Yeah, so if you go to, if you do a search for a TED talk, there are actually two. There's um, one from a couple of years ago. This is by the same guy from the Wake Forest um, Center for Regenerative Medicine. So if you search for, I think, Wake Forest TED talk, you'll find a couple of them. There's one that's quite recent, it's only a couple of months old, and that's where they do a demonstration of printing a kidney. And the older one, I think they talk about the. Um, regenerating a bladder, or they print a bladder, and um, it's actually been in this young patient now for, I think, about five years. So this stuff has already been done. It's, we're in the refinement stage, not the um, can it be done stage. Curiosity, do they still need to have anti-rejection drugs, or is it all compatible? Does it all come from, came from that, Yeah, that, um, that's a very big issue, and that really depends on the particular material that is used for printing. Um, this is getting into an area that I'm certainly not an expert on, so I can't give definitive answers, but um, if you print with a material that is, um, that is generalized, that could be accepted, or that is um, harvested material from the patient, um, one of the things that has been done, I think, in a number of experiments is taking material and then um, growing it, like taking a sample of um, skin from a patient and then growing it. Uh, in that case, you won't have any rejection issues. I'm just interested to know um, what you think the risks are with this type of technology. And the example that I've given is, you know, we, we start off now, it's really empowering, it's really exciting, but you know, in the future we might have molecular assemblers that will allow me to download a CAD file and create uranium from my bedroom. <laughs> so what, what do you think about that other risks on the way to that, uh, and how do we mitigate those risks? Well, there are, um, there are lots of levels of risk. You're talking about um, a cataclysmic event, but there are smaller ones as well. For example, um, once you have devices that can print, well, in fact, they're already around, but once consumers have easy access to devices that can print with metal or that can print with materials that are physically very hard, you combine that with some chemistry and you can print yourself a gun. Like, there are all sorts of things you can do. Um, I, su I suppose my attitude to that is that uh, you, if you wanted to make a knife, all you need is a grinder and a bit of metal. This is... Um, this is not really going to necessarily stop someone from doing that. Perhaps it will give them tools that they wouldn't otherwise have, but it doesn't really fundamentally change um, you know, people's motivations or what they're going to try to achieve. 
that's I think that's more of a social issue than a technological issue. What are the IP implications of this kind of technology? <laughs> uh, yeah, very interesting. Um, that's something that has been um, quite a debate within the open hardware community over the last couple of years. There have Open source in terms of software is a reasonably <coughs> well understood problem. Uh, there have been some good minds working on that for quite a few years now. And so we have well accepted licenses that have been tested in law courts. Um, and that is now being, it's also being applied to content. There are things like Creative Commons um, being applied to media and um, you know, that sort of thing, or writing. But then it becomes much more difficult when you're dealing with something like electronics. There was a, the first global open hardware summit took place last year where this was one of the major questions is how do we license this stuff? And what's been happening so far is that people have been taking licenses from other fields of endeavour like open source software licenses or creative commons licenses and applying them to things like designs for electronics when it's not really necessarily, it's not for that purpose, it doesn't really fit. So there's a lot of work going on at the moment with things like um, open hardware licenses specifically uh, to make that clearer so that you know that I, if you have designed something, you want to release it and, um, and you, know, you want people to get certain benefits from it and you want to prevent other things, it's not such a grey area. You're not taking, um, say, a license design for print media and applying it to the design of a circuit board, which is a little bit of a stretch and it may not stand up in court. So the short answer is that's very grey at the moment and there is a lot of work going on very rapidly. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much guys. Sorry about being over time, but it's just so, so interesting. interesting. <laughs>